<laughs> so, Royce is uh, one of the inaugural uh, members of Xavier Exponential, which is uh, our honors experience on campus. It's designed around or created, structured around the concept of using design thinking to tackle interdisciplinary, complex social issues of their choosing, right? But to learn these skills, to become active in the world with knowledge, which of course is what we do at Xavier, right? And so um, Royce is, has a particular interest in environmental justice and in global health. Uh, he did summer research at the Albert Einstein School of Medicine. He is the president of our chapter of Alpha Lambda Delta, our honor society. He is, I just learned, a volunteer EMS uh, member, worker. He is an EMT. He's a volunteer at EMT in town. I asked him what he did in his spare time, and what is it, something that is taking his, uh, the area he's looking to specialize in and serving in it as a volunteer. And so he is particularly well suited to introduce our speaker, uh, Sarah Bloom. So Royce, welcome. Sarah A. Burton is the author of the instant New York Times bestseller, The Yellow House. A brilliant, haunting, and unforgettable memoir about the inexorable pull of home and family, set in Shotgun House in New Orleans East. Heralded as one of this year's best memoirs, an urgent meditation of the American dream, a remarkable journey, and an instantly essential text examining the past, present, impossible future of the city of New Orleans and of America at large. Sarah's debut has been dubbed a must-read book in over 15 publications, including the LA Times, the Washington Post, Vanity Fair, NPR, and Time. Sarah's previous work has appeared in the New, York, New Yorker, the New York Times Magazine, the Oxford Magazine, and O, oh, the Oprah Magazine, among others. A native New Orleans she received her master's in journalism from the University of California, Berkeley in 2004. She was awarded a, Whitley, a Whiting Foundation Creative Foundation grant in 2016 and was a finalist for the New York Foundation of the Arts Fellowship in Creative Nonfiction in 2011. She has also been awarded fellowships at Jurassic Residence Artist Program and the McDowell Colony. She lives in New York State, but we're honored to have her back in our hometown. At, at Xavier University of Louisiana. And now it's time for a conversation with Sarah Brewer, moderated by Professor Sharon Roberts. in 2005 
and then 2006, and thinking about what the loss of that house actually means, that it's more than just a place missing from the surface, right? And, and that search to think about, you know, what stories would that house have told? I mean, I remember so many of us were driving around the city, right, in those harrowing days, and seeing all the missing houses. And for me, that was such a profound experience to think, you know, this is beyond a structure being gone. This, this, these, this is people's legacy gone. These are people's stories gone. And the implications of that um, are, are huge, right? So from the story of the house, I wanted to think about New Orleans East and why New Orleans East, I felt, was missing from so many stories that, that were being told about what it means to be a New Orleanian. And I wanted to, to trace that uh, history and start to think about when New Orleans East began a kind of, to go down the road of being excluded from the narrative of what it means to be from here. And I also wanted to change the map of New Orleans in a way and expand it so that the people I loved and the people I grew up with and played with were also on the map. So literally putting them on the map. How did you go about getting some of these stories? You recalled memories of connecting people's homes to institutions, places, grocery stores, corner stores that existed in the East. Talk a little bit about that process of recovering that particular history and leaving it as a record in your book because whatever comes after is built on this specific past experience of those who were there and how they made life and community there. Sure, so a lot of the history of the East happened before I was born. You know, I was born right on the cusp of the 80s. And so the first thing I did was I commenced all of these sort of groups. I found all the neighbors who lived on the street when I was growing up and even before I was born. And we had uh, these interviews, these huge interviews of eight to 10 people, all of whom were telling their story of what it was like to grow up. I grew up on Wilson Avenue off of Shetlander Highway. It was sort of, I call it the short end of a long street because it was cut off by Shetlander. How many of you guys know Chef? Right, okay, so that was sort of the scene of my growing up life, that, that you had to cross the dangerous Chef Mentor Highway to get to the rest of your life. You know, you had to cross Chef to get to uh, Jefferson Davis Elementary, it was at the time, and you had to cross Chef to get to Swagman's and K&B and, and all the places where your life took place. And, you know, part, so part of what I did was to gather together all the people and say, what was it like for you? And in the course of those conversations, I learned a lot of history, but I didn't just take people's words for it. Then I went to the library. So I was at the UNO library and, and at the, the public library um, and at the historic New Orleans collection, uh, looking at city directories, doing chain of title searches in the microfiche. So if someone would say to me, you know, uh, there, the, the, you know, the Grove came up, was built in 1965, then I'd go off and sort of fact check that, that detail, and, and I'd learn more things, and then I could come back to them and say, but what about this? I found this detail, do you remember that? So in a way, it wasn't for me an exercise in, in just remembering. It was an exercise in trying to sort of collect the pieces of my family's history in this place, and to use the archives to do that, so that the thing that I built was based on something real and solid, right, which is sort of the opposite of the ground in a way. Mm -hmm. yeah. In order to make this book authentic, you pulled on the voices that you knew of the community, your neighbors, and your family. So I want to read what your brother Simon noted about the opening up their world, right? To all uh, readers and audiences. Um, Simon pointed out, as uh, Sarah writes in the book, there is a lot we have subconsciously agreed that we don't want to know. In our journey of reliving our childhood, what did you discover about why we put a lid of silence around memories? And why do we only relive 
imagined versions of our lives. Ooh. <laughs> wow, you are very good. <laughs> I think to protect ourselves. And um, the thing that I learned working on this book, which took about eight years, was the inordinate amount of pain caused by reflecting on things. And it was really hard sometimes to realize that the story I had been telling myself was not the truth as it happened. And to, to come up against the great power of a single story. And I think the, one of the ways that I began to realize this was, um, you know, we all, I think, tell ourselves stories. Joe Didion said that famously. Um, but I had come to make up stories about, you know, where my, my childhood friend died. And I, I came to tell myself, oh, he died just close to our house, right there at the corner. And by doing research, I realized that, no, he didn't die by the corner. He died quite a while away. Or, or I wanted to believe, for instance, that, that he had had a headstone uh, when we buried him. And in fact, he didn't have a headstone. And, and so I, I was telling myself these things, I think, in order to be the kind of person maybe I imagined myself to be. And when I was in college, I was going around telling people, you know, I'm interesting because I'm from New Orleans, and I can drink under the table because I'm from New Orleans, <laughs> and I'm charming because I'm from New Orleans. And I think the moment when you stop merging with the place you're from, you then you feel quite naked, you know? And so this work for me was a sort of excavation of that. So what does it mean to be the baby of 12 growing up um, in a yellow house in New Orleans East? And so I had to do the work. So I think, you know, this happens also when we talk about New Orleans, right? We want to tell a more jovial version of what it means to be living here sometimes. And I love New Orleans for all the things that makes it a great city. But New Orleans also has major dysfunction. And, and, and I think it's impossible to say that you love a person or a place and not look upon that person or place with, uh, you know, honesty about the fact that nothing is all good, you know? So this was hard to do because I was bringing up things also for my family that they didn't want to deal with. Were there some things you thought very long and hard about leaving in and taking out? Sure. And how did you reconcile which parts of stories you will tell and which ones you will just keep closed? So many things I left out. I think what helped me was that I did a lot of interviews with my family. So I. I visited all of them, explained the project of the book, and over the course of a year, collected hundreds of hours of interviews with them. And I had a little tape recorder so they could see that it was real. And so part of it, I didn't tell stories that didn't propel the story forward, or didn't sort of make of them real people, because the, the goal here was not to create hagiography, right? So I didn't want to write these stilted characters who you really couldn't relate to or who weren't real people. I wanted them to be full on the page, to sound like themselves and, you know, so the reader could see them, which for me is a form of honor. And, but there were moments when things were uh, very personal. And in those moments, I would ask the sibling, you know, I, I really feel that I need to tell this story for this reason, what do you think? And, and essentially get their permission to tell it. My mom says now that, you know, there were things she wished I hadn't published. Okay. Even though she told me those things. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good segue to the next question. Um, woman, featured very prominently in your memory. Um, you have your grandmother, Lily Me, and I remain and they are central to the shaping of your family. 
And many times when women are portrayed in memory or in fiction, there's often, particularly for black women, that magical presentation of them. A mother who takes care of 12 children buys her own home at 18, right? And is a matriarch of so many generations. You've come several decades after your first, your first child. Um, we don't always get to see that portrayal of them being strong, but also very fragile. Mm -hmm. So talk a little bit about the importance for you as a black woman writing this memory to portray these three strong women as not just magical black women, but in all of the facets that they are as human beings. Well, I, I think that was the project for me, is to portray these people in the way that they actually are, as opposed to the story of who they might be, which maybe is an American tendency and an American story. And my work is sort of a response to, the, to that tendency in America. I feel often that uh, we have a problem, or, or it's hard for us sometimes, to uh, contextualize people, right? To sort of present people in their full context. And that was critical for me when I was talking about my mother, because, you know, my grandmother, for instance, you know, grew up, um, you know, uh, off Chocolatula Street and sort of was in this community of women who were very matriarchal and who called themselves whatever name they chose. You know, my grandmother essentially renamed herself, following after this group of women, and also told her children, no, you're going to call me this now. And I saw that as a powerful reclaiming of the self, right? So in writing the story, I had to sort of follow these women's lead. And in fact, these women weren't just the trope of the kind of hardworking homemaker. My grandmother tried very hard to be part of the Great Migration, you know, and, and sort of failed at it. And she, she left her children to do that, right? And, and so there were ways in which she absolutely was a striver and an imperfect person. Um, and so I felt that if I didn't think about the details, what went into making these women who they were, then I would sort of miss a crucial aspect of this story. And I wanted also, you know, when I was growing up, there were no stories of these kinds of women who were, who were New Orleans women. And, and, and so my job was to do the, the best job I possibly could to portray them with enormous breadth and insight. You, you get into really interesting conversations about black women in terms of their own sense of identity and worth. You talk about the woman's relationship to the men in their lives, the woman's relationship to black beauty, and you help to sort of explain how the times shaped how they felt about themselves, when they also passed down to children. What stood out to you in uncovering those memories? Where did they come from? Was it from your siblings, your own reflection? How did you think back on what was passed down to you from them? I think a little bit of all of the above. So after I collected the interviews, I myself transcribed the large majority of them. So I was listening to these voices in my head for hours and hours, like typing out exactly what they were saying. And I think that's a kind of meditative work and experience, um, as is writing. And so that, for me, was the work of writing, to try to put the pieces together and say, how did this person get from here to here? And what composed that person? You know, my mother, for instance, uh, I had a theory going in that my mother was an artist, that, that she would be an artist. Right? Um, but she had 12 children, and her first child when she was 60 or so, and she wasn't allowed, she went to book her tea, and she wasn't allowed back, right? Because the year after she had the kid, they instituted a policy that said if you have a child, you can't come back to the school. You had to go to a school for all the girls who had had children. 
And so my mother was so crushed by this that she just dropped out of school, right? But she was always a voracious reader. She was the way I came to know language and to love the sound of words. Um, and so I, I sort of approached her, not as my mother, which is like most people's tendency, right? To see our parents as these sort of givers of life and various other things we need desperately, right? But to see her as a woman, and that for me was the major shift, to go beyond her sort of role in life, to start to humanize her. Um, and, and so by doing that, I felt that, you know, I broke through to something a little bit deeper than where we would otherwise sort of land. I want to talk a little bit, shift from your recollection of family mm -hmm. to your recollection of place and city, um, and as well of the home. Um, I want to shift a little bit to Katrina, and one of the interesting references that you bring up as an analogy in the book is about water. You describe water as being boundaries around the city, um, water accounting for the loss, water accounting for the sense of community. Your siblings lived through Betsy, so they know a city before and after water. Um, do you feel what has been lost after 2005 without such works like yours about memory? We risk losing the DNA of the place. Well, that's something that's on my mind a lot, right? What, what the places that we knew were before now? And I think for many of us who are native New Orleanians, we're always trying to remember, what was that before, right? And, and how to sort of call up the names of places, or when you see that, you know, the Lafitte is now whatever it's called, um, you try to think of the people you knew who lived there, right? And, and sort of the world before now. And so for me, this was an exercise in that, in saying, Everywhere we look was something else. And that's a kind of trauma to people who grow up in a place. And even now I think about that because when I go to the spot where I grew up and I see that it's just a field of green grass, I think no one would know the story of this place unless I you know, had reported it. Right? And so this is something that matters so much in a place like New Orleans that's changing very, very quickly. Um, and, and where, by the way, many people are still displaced and have yet to return. And many of these people are, in fact, the keepers of memory, right? So I think when a place changes and when the construction of a place changes and the population of a place changes, we also lose so much in terms of history. And you know, it's important for me to note that I take no pleasure in, and there should be thousands and thousands of native New Orleanians writing their story. This is, and I think many are writing their story, right? But not everyone gets published. Not everyone's stories are heard. And so for me, the project and the job is maybe this is one book of I hope many, many, many additions to the story. Uh, that get told, and I think that those records are crucial, especially for the time we're in now. Um, Jami Demuel TV recently <coughs> produced a series called The Forgotten East. Um, in your book on page 331, you have an interesting encounter at a used bookstore on Olean Street, and you write, the East, he said, was too young for history when you asked about why there aren't many books about the East. Um, but you write that this was faulty logic. We are all born into histories, worlds existing before us. The same is true of places. No place is without history. Your book is a start to say this is a place, it has a history, and its history is connected to other histories. Why was the East so easy 
to be white enough in memory? Why has its recovery been by far the most sluggish in this city? And what are your hopes and fears about this place that is your home? She has like the eight part question. <laughs> the master of the eight part question. Um, well, let's start firstly with why was the East so easy to be white dog? Well, I think we started, those of us who were paying attention started to sort of notice this in, um, you know, after the oil bus times. And I noticed it because our streets started to change. I always am interested in the view outside the window. You can tell a lot from what you see when you look out the window, you know. So in our case, there were people living in residential areas. And then over time, there were businesses somehow popping up <laughs> across the street. It sort of was like, well, what's happening here? And then um, you would see, you know, the, 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 there was like the red barn, it became like the ebony barn, right? So, so white people were leaving uh, in droves. And uh, so that's sort of the way we start to notice divestment. Um, and, and then a lot of black people were coming in. The, the, the housing stock changed. Rather than build more and more houses, there were more and more sort of apartment complexes. Uh, I remember very vividly when the skating rink closed. I remember when the movie theater left. I remember when the plaza started shutting down, right? So an actual just lack of investment, right? And, and I think that this has a ripple effect. And that's for me where the story of a place really matters because I spent a year, 2011, living in the French Quarter at the corner of Royal and St. Peter Street. And what was fascinating to, to witness there, because so much money is spent there, right? Like, the tourists come there, and we really need them to buy into the story of New Orleans at that street corner. That's where Doreen, the clarinetist, plays, and Rouse's is there. And, you know, you can really see the story of the city unfolding, right? It's this magical place. There are random bubbles being blown in the air for no reason whatsoever. Yeah. It's, you know, the balconies are gorgeous. And in the morning, it smells amazing, right? There's this sort of lemon scent in the air. And, you know, where did it come from, right? And, and you start to understand the correlation between investment, you know, and, and the charm story, right? the natural charm a place has. So I think in terms of Norman's East, the other part of it is that it's just not as pretty. You know, there are no colorful houses. You know, there aren't the bright pink and bright green houses. It doesn't necessarily have the signs and signifiers of what it means to be from New Orleans, which of course doesn't make it any less a place, right? And so, so I was experiencing this, and I still experience it with my siblings who live there, who still to this day, have, you know, uh, trash pickup, which happens every now and then. And like, there are real problems. I saw a story recently about the proliferation of Dollar Generals when there are only three grocery stores mm -hmm. for a huge swath of, 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 of people, right? So I think what ends up happening is that um, we all go and we invest in the place where we can afford to live, right? But, but if we're not, deemed to be worthy enough, or if the tax dollars aren't high enough, right? That changes the quality of your life and the quality of services. And, and I don't know that we're having real conversations about that. I think I need time for one more question before we open it up, I, I think so. So I'm gonna sort of go with this sort of takeaway question. Um, the book ends with a nice explanation about um, having a new way of reconsidering history 101, as you put it. Um, and why writing our lived histories is a form of reclaiming our spaces, um, particularly for African Americans. Um, what is your hope that this book does in not just leaving your family and your histories homeless because the Yellow House isn't there anymore, but for all African Americans who've occupied a space and it's very easy to forget that that space made community. Um, 
why is it important to have these types of works uh, to leave a record for the black experience wherever it is um, and however it changes? Well, I think I, you know, I wrote this book for all of my many nieces and nephews who grew up mostly in the East and just didn't have a story of what life was like. And they are honestly the people I wrote this book for. And I think there have to be many, many more of these kinds of stories, like I said before. And, um, and I wrote it so that we could think about the, the sort of tug of place, the way that we're tethered to places, and the enormous meaning of that. That, that place is something that is, is a bit, this is a very human thing for me. That, that we belong to places and places belong to us. And that we have to sort of interrogate what that actually means and, and start to reconcile with our ideas and notions of home and also belonging. I, at this point, would like to invite um, students and faculty to um, ask questions to Sarah. Um, if you've had the opportunity to read any part of her book, if you've read um, about her work, um, this would be a great point to ask any question about the East, the recovery of the East, um, and Sarah's reliving of memory in the East. Hi. Maybe we're going to give you a mic over here. Okay. Why I call it the water, 
is to talk about the, the systems, the navigation channels, for instance, that, that also create a kind of uh, place for storms to sort of build power and strength and become even worse than they would have been, but also uh, to think about the forces that are bigger than places and that sort of cut them off from, from the rest of the city, you know? And so for all of us who go over the high rise, you know, you know the feeling of that, that somehow you're leaving one zone and entering another one, right? And that, that, that's such a visceral feeling for me as a person from here, you know? Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Um, we talked earlier today on lunch, so we enjoyed your uh, discussion in the classroom. So I wanted to ask you to talk a little bit more about why you titled your chapters as movements, and then that's a super question. And then also how you saw yourself as a writer change over that course of eight years in your own identity during that time. Mm -hmm. So why movement? So the, the sections are called movements. I think it as a very musical, is a is a, a sort of homage to what it means partly to be from here, right? To be from this very musical place. And to think as a writer about how to um, give a nod to how important music is to me uh, without saying, I'm a musical person and music means a lot to me, uh, right? And so, um, and then also I thought of the work itself as a kind of symphonic piece, right? So that if you're, in, I even thought of like Fela Kuti, if you listen to like a 14 minute Fela Kuti track, right? The way that it sort of changes. And so I wanted the reader to see it as a piece that built over time, right? So it feels different somehow in each movement, and each movement gives you sort of space in a way, but by the end there's a kind of great crescendo and it all builds and it all makes more sense, right? Um, and, and then also to sort of talk about the actual physical movement, the, the displacement of people. Um, you know, following uh, many of the storms that have happened and continue to happen. Um, and to just talk about what it feels like for me to be a New Orleans native who comes home and then leaves again a lot of times, you know? So it's, it's about all of that. And how did I change? Maybe I became a writer writing this book. Thank you. feel from a place you once knew to a place that no longer exists after Katrina when you went back and you saw your dad's tree? And what thoughts were you experiencing mentally and emotionally? So the story is that my father, um, when before I was born, when they first moved into the house, he planted these two cedar trees. And um, after the storm, there was only one of them left. And so when I went back, I guess a few weeks ago or a few months ago, um, it was shocking to see the gigantic tree on the lot and that being the sort of only identifier of the place. You know, we used to pass through these two trees to walk a kind of pathway to the front door. You know, the trees always sort of outdid the house. You know, they were fancier than the house, the trees. And so it was so, it was sort of sad for me to feel so lost on the place I used to know so well, you know? To sort of feel like, well, where was the other tree? Was it over here or over there? And, you know, where was the front door? And that, that feels like a kind of dislocation that gets in your bones. And all of us who have lost, you know, um, anyone who has lost maybe anything, understands that, the sense that you are somehow misplaced. So those trees have so much significance, and I thought it was a small story, but several people have come up to me and said, I, just, I have trees, you know, we have trees, so. Thank you. Thank you. Like, was there a sense of struggle or was that like normal for you? 
Yeah, it was pretty normal. It was, all <laughs> <laughs> it was sort of the wild, wild west. And um, now I'm, I'm sort of, it's because I grew up with so many siblings, I, it's awkward for me when there are fewer than like, you know, I like rooms with a lot of people in them. You know, I like to be surrounded. There's a feeling you start to get used to of being surrounded and having a lot of characters around you. You know, um, and so when you when I meet someone who's like an only uh, child, I look at upon them as if they're a space alien, and I'm just like, what's that like? You know, and and there are ways that I know I was part of so many kids because to this day I hate field trips. Anything that's like groups of people going together to a place, I can't because it reminds me of my childhood, and I love solitude so much. Because you know, when you're growing up in a camelback shotgun with that many people, you never have privacy. You know? So um, yeah, so it was great. I mean, you know, it made me who I am. Uh, and I don't have any concept of any other way, you know. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you. I like talking about my siblings. <laughs> um, I just wanted to ask, you talked earlier about kind of the conflict that happens whenever you're looking back at your past and it's different from like what you imagine, what you kind of clung to. So I wanted to ask like, what do you do in that in-between time to where you're like, oh, like it really wasn't like that? And like, how do you get back to the love of like your childhood and like all the concepts like that whenever you're also facing the reality that it's really different from what you thought it was? Yeah, that's a great question. How you sort of reconcile yourself yeah. to the story you've been telling versus what it actually is. Well, I think that's hard to do. You just have to, you know, the, the way I'll put it is this. You know, um, uh, Dr. Michael White, who was here, told me, we were having coffee, and he said, you know, there are these, I'm sure there's video of your father when we played in Dr. Pauline's brass band, and I'm sure that somewhere in the, historic neurons collection, there's some video of us playing. And so I went there, the dutiful student, and I like sat there and I went through so many films and my mother, I had at that time about six photographs of my father. In the book I say my father has six pictures. And that was all I knew of him. And so I was going off of these pictures, trying to find my father on the video. And, and I, I said, there he is one day, there's my father. I saw a guy, he sort of seemed to have the kind of coolness I thought my father would have. You know, he had like loud verb. I was like, that's him, that's absolutely him. And I rushed up and I got like images made of my father and I put them in a manila folder and I sort of carried them around the city. And one day my mother came over after I carried these pictures of my father forever and I knew that I had found him. My mother came and she looked at these and she was sort of like, no, that's really not your dad. <laughs> but the, the reason I'm telling that story is it, it felt good to hold on to the idea of it. And in a way, I didn't want to show the pictures because I didn't want it to not be him, you know? And when she told me that, it completely devastated me for a long time, right? Uh, because then I had to go back to scratch. So I think we also make choices to actually believe the thing we know to be. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, so so that's sort of an around the way, ethereal way of answering your question. And then I have one more question. And then you were talking about seeing your mom as like a human being as opposed to like, oh, like she's my mother, my life giver or whatever. So obviously doing that, you have to see flaws that are associated with her. How did you, I'm not say love her again, but just like how do you, I don't know, like bridge the gap to like, okay, like this is my mother and like, this is a human being, if that makes sense. Like, how do you balance it out? Well, that was never a problem for me, because I, I found her to be interesting mm -hmm. as a person. You know, like I literally think of her as an intriguing human, which is probably why I'm her favorite kid. <laughs> <laughs> no, so I, let, I just let her be. I never had a problem with that. Right. I like her being complicated and really nuanced. Um, while I give an opportunity for more of you to come to the mic and uh, ask questions, I wanted to sort of uh, touch on something we haven't spoken about yet, which is one of
of Sarah's role was to communicate the city's recovery. She was part of what was called Megan City Hall. Is anyone here from City Hall? <laughs> They're hiding in the back. <laughs> in the book, Sarah relives what it's like to see the flaws in power, um, to witness Megan, um, sometimes dismissive, but also um, believing his own vision as well, um, wanting the city to be where it needed to be, even if it wasn't quite there yet. Um, and your job and role was to communicate this. And you felt conflicted in many moments about the realities and what the vision was. Uh, could you share a little bit more about what it was like to be part of Nagin City Hall? And for students who are going into political science, you know, mass communication, um, social work, sociology, to understand what it's like to be part of a ground game team and having to balance your own feelings about a plan or an objective or a goal um, and working with people in power. So, you know, I went into City Hall feeling that I would somehow gain an understanding of how New Orleans worked, and I think the exact opposite happened. I was more confused by the end. Uh, but the thing I also want to say, which is meaningful to me, is that in those days, which was around 2008, everyone working in City Hall was also kind of displaced. Some people were still living in trailers. Some people were, I mean, some people were literally living in formaldehyde trailers. You know, remember that whole scandal? And people were like me during their lunch breaks, going down, there was a road home office in City Hall in those days. And a lot of us were lined up trying to solve road home cases. And so the thing that is significant also to me is that we were a traumatized bunch, okay? And, and beyond that, I felt part of my limitation was that I wasn't exactly on the policy side. I was the person going around talking about how great the city was doing. But my family, my mother, still hadn't received her road home payment, right? They were undervaluing the house and all these things were happening. So it was very hard for me to align that reality with saying, you know, oh, it's really good, we're building this new auditorium, you know? Um, and that was just a hard job for me to do. And at the same time, there was a shortage of housing and homelessness was completely out of control. Right? And they were literally tearing down housing development, so there were protests outside the window. You know, I felt like I was having a stroke every other day. And there was no way to sort of keep up, right? Um, and so in a way, that job taught me the kind of pitfalls of power and the ways in which, in a sense, the city and all of its strategies to sort of prevent corruption were in fact slowing down recovery in a way, right? Because there were like 12 steps to access money, right? And so it, it just, it all felt very slow like molasses and, and not quite attuned to the pulse of what people needed. You know, and then and there was also sort of the Nagin force, let's call it that, which was predominantly about, you know, talking about all his dysfunction. And I actually found that to be a distraction from us actually talking about the city and what the city needed. You know, there were, there was so much coverage just about you know the credit card scandal and the gas scandal and the you know wiretapping scandal. And you know there were so many scandals. Right. It, was, it was difficult to change the. It narrative. was really hard to just work and, and really think about policy and were people getting what they needed and what was the drainage system doing. And what were all these trips to the Netherlands about, you know, and what could really happen for the city? How did you find ways to get your own voice in the conversation in those meetings in City Hall? Well, that was a you know, moot point, but, you know, <laughs> I did in the State of the City speech, which is made of many people, but, you know, I was the communications person, and I, that, you know, I was talking about the East nonstop. If you go and look at that speech, it's like, for all the people in the East, he's saying from the stage, because that was sort of my obsession and my fear.
feeling that you know people were being sort of left there in a way, and, and not just in the East, in many different neighborhoods, right? We see this happening. Um, but my, it felt poultry. It felt this. This was like the most um, inadequate I felt in any job. I wanted to point out another interesting experience that Sarah had. Uh, at one point when she uh, visited the city, she encountered a bellhop who, by his line of questioning, assumed she was not a New Orleans native, which hurt my feelings. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you recognize your city? Do you feel like you still belong? With all the changes, with all the new residents, um, you know, histories are connected to histories. In that moment, did you say, well, maybe it will never be the new audience that I know? How do I find my own way back home? Um, yeah, I think I'm more connected now. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think, you know, so part of this is that when I was growing up in New Orleans East, you know, I was in New Orleans and I was really <laughs> deeply connected. And I think now um, there, it feels like there's more at stake, you know, in a way. And, and so I think I love the city more which is why I then tried to really think about what the city is a lot more. Um, and I think maybe I'll be trying to work through that forever in some way, shape, or form of my own writing, you know? Mm -hmm. But it's also important for you, for those who have now made New Orleans their home, yeah. to be able to understand the legacy that those, and the consent of community, that those who were there before had created. But whether they will, is up for grabs. But the bellhop, you know, I, I always wanted to be known and accepted most by the people who were my people, right? That's sort of the most important thing. When you leave home, you want to come back home, and the people who know you from home be like, hi, welcome back. So when people are like, are you from here? You don't sound like you're from here. <laughs> then I'm sort of like, what? You know, and then I just start saying all sorts of New Orleans and shit. <laughs> to prove my point, or, you know. but but yeah, I mean, I think it's it's important to feel a sense of belonging, especially um, in in cities like this, which in the book I call like the city of feeling. You know, a city we all have some kind of like strange relationship to that we can't always define with words. And um, I want to feel that I belong to my siblings who are here. And I, you know, I never want to feel that I've gone so far away that I'm not theirs anymore. You know what I mean? Yeah. Sure. I would like to open it back up for, and we can take another question, Dr. Brown. Yeah. I think we're good. I have, I have one. Um, I listened to you, and I have the same feeling about when I went back to my hometown after a long time, and it's been, it's very depressed and has been for many, many years. And, um, and I have to, to the point where I don't want to go back anymore. And so what part of this is just the old, you can never go home kind of thing, right? When you look back, you walk into a room, it looks so much smaller than it used to do. It used to be, a, except for your house not being there, but I mean, as far as the, the New Orleans is, you know, it changes. Sure. Everything changes. And so, yeah, but I mean, your story is wonderful, and it made me think about my home. Mm -hmm. And it makes me think about this young man from Detroit, and Detroit had that, right? The same thing, mm -hmm. you know? Sure. So. I wonder how home morphs, though. Because for me, I, I feel that part of what happened after this book was that the way I thought of home changed. And home became a little more philosophical feeling, yeah. like home being the group of people around me, or a place that I make, or the way someone makes me feel, or, right? And, and I do think there is something about returning to a physical place, which feels impossible. Right. But, but I'm so obsessed with the question and the nature of home, the way it sort of uh, shapeshifts in a way, right? It becomes different things. And the way that I was traveling all over the globe, and seeing people who reminded me of someone I knew from New Orleans, for instance, right? So the way we sort of project our ideas of home onto other places. So I just wonder, these are, I have a thousand questions about home. 
after writing this book. You think I'd have like some sort of resolution, right? So I don't think that no, really goes yeah. away. So I'm only at the beginning, tip of the iceberg. Right where you're supposed to be. Yeah. Um, I wanted to leave this thought that well, I think summarizes um, this work of yours um, about the Yellow House and the loss of home, which is what Katrina um, meant for many um, New Orleans residents. Um, Sarah writes, when the house fell down, the Yellow House that is, it can be said, something in me opened up. Cracks help a house resolve internally its pressures and stresses my engineer friend had said. Houses provide a frame that bears us up. Without that physical structure, we are the house that bears itself up. I was now the house. Oh. And with this book, you are moving yellow house. Right? Thank you. It's not there. Thank you.